All right, um, my name is Jeremy Evans and I'm here to talk about SQL, the database toolkit for Ruby. SQL has only been around two years and I don't know much about the first year. I was only using SQL a month before I became maintainer last March. I didn't read much of SQL's source until after I became maintainer and what I found distressed me. The basic design was good, but the implementation was messy. Many features were implemented by overriding methods, there was very little documentation, and all methods were public. The advanced filtering at the time required parse tree, and the code for that was the ugliest. I deprecated some things I thought were obviously bad ideas, and I worked on a replacement for the parse tree filters. The expression filters I added in 2.0 let you write advanced filters without requiring parse tree or handwritten SQL. I removed parsing support in 2.2, which allowed me to support Ruby 1.9 and JRuby in 2.3. I added prepared statement support and sharding support in 2.4, which was impressive as it came only two weeks after 2.3. Since then, there have been a lot of features added and a lot of bugs fixed. Now, SQL is split into two parts, core and model. This is different than the DM core more split, where more adds features to core. SQL core is a Ruby interface to an SQL database. It's great for generating reports or dealing with sets of rows instead of single rows. SQL model is an object relational mapper built on top of core. Model classes are built on top of core data sets, so you get the benefit of core when using model. At an instance level, model is similar to AR, DM, and basic usage. Model depends on core, but core does not depend on model, and you could probably use a core data set to return AR objects if you wanted to. SQL currently supports 13 database adapters. Some databases are supported by multiple adapters. Some adapters support multiple databases, though the best supported adapters are the native ones. I test MySQL, PostgreSQL, and SQLite using the native, JDBC, and data objects adapters, all of which have good support. I know SQL users who are using the ADO, Firebird, ODBC, and Oracle adapters successfully, and I haven't received bug reports about the others. One reason SQL supports many adapters is the adapters are easy to write. Only five methods are required. Adapters range in size from 50 lines for OpenBase to 1,200 for PostgreSQL. The PostgreSQL adapter supports three native drivers, native prepared statements, and even methods to add database triggers and functions, which is the reason it's so large. Now, adding five methods is enough to return results, but it's not enough for full support. The delete and update methods should return the number of rows modified, and the insert method should return the auto-incrementing primary key value. Getting insert fully supported usually takes the most time. If you're adding support for a new database, you have to deal with SQL syntax differences. SQL makes this as easy as possible as it is designed for flexibility over performance. You generally just have to override a few short methods. Running the integration test is the best way to test adapter support. After requiring SQL, you should create a database object via the connect method. The convention for an application using a single database is to store the database object in a constant named DB. The main use for this object is to create dataset objects for queries, but it handles transactions and other things too such as you can use it to change the default settings for data sets and add SQL loggers. The transaction method is the only way to use an SQL transaction. It ensures that all access to the database inside the block uses the same connection inside a database transaction. Now, each database object has a separate thread-safe connection pool. SQL was well designed to use the con connection pool when I became maintainer. I've added a few features, but most of it's the same. It's designed for high concurrency, where SQL uses the pool for the least amount of time necessary. SQL doesn't check out a connection until the final SQL string is ready to be sent to the database and returns the connection as soon as it is finished iterating over the results. SQL ensures connections are not leaked, so you don't have to need to clean up connections manually or use a Reaper thread. There's also a single threaded pull that's faster if thread safety isn't important. The SQL da data set is really its defining object, and by that it means it's what separates SQL from other Ruby database libraries. It uses a functional style API where you build queries by chaining methods, and it doesn't send the query to the database until you ask it to. The thing to note here is the lack of any SQL strings. You can write complex database applications in SQL without ever writing any actual SQL code. You can use SQL and code all your SQL by hand too if you want. To request records, you use each or all. Each yields the records as they arrive, and all loads all records first. Some adapters buffer all rows in memory first, but with others, each works on a million record data set without loading everything in menu memory. You can set an arbitrary proc called the row proc to call with a row before yielding, which is how model instances are returned by data sets. Data sets do no caching of records, calling each twice sends two queries. Inserting, updating, and deleting records should be intuitive. Be careful with delete and update as they affect all rows in the receiver. Remember this, delete first, update second. You should note the use of symbols for database columns. SQL generally treats Ruby strings as SQL strings, and Ruby symbols as SQL columns. 
SQL supports simple filters using strings and hashes. SQL uses hashes for both equality and inclusion. You can see here the difference between the use of a string and the use of a symbol for LN. Now, SQL also lets you write your queries as Ruby expressions without using parse tree by adding methods that Ruby does not define. These examples show that SQL knows about Boolean logic, leading to a cleaner looking SQL. The subselect example shown here shows how data sets can be used with other data sets. Even these filters are just the tip of the iceberg. Queries can get much more complex than this, and SQL handles them just fine. Putting your objects directly in your queries feels natural to me, more so to use, than using strings with placeholders. The expression syntax is terse, but hopefully intuitive. Be aware that one of the issues with uh, doing this, using the bitwise operators in place of the logical ones, is you often need to use extra parentheses. Now, if you do string manip manipulation in the database, SQL can help. It supports concatenating strings and doing like searches. It also supports full text searching on some databases. I mentioned that SQL uses symbols for columns, but it also uses them for tables and schemas. Because columns also often need to be qualified or aliased, you can specify the qualifier alias in the symbol itself. A double underscore separates a table from a column, and a triple underscore separates a column from an alias. You can use methods that, that do the same thing. You can also use this for schema qualified tables, which SQL supports well. Now, SQL makes joining tables very easy and flexible. You need to provide the join type, table, and conditions. The typical foreign key to primary key join uses a hash with the key being the column symbol and the table being joined, and the value being the com column symbol in the current table, or the last table joined. You can use complex conditions with an expression filter. You can also use a using join or a natural join. SQL has helper methods for common join types. If you're doing multiple joins in your query, often you'll have a condition that refers to a previous table instead of the current table and the ta or the table being joined. If that is the case, you need to qualify that column yourself, as otherwise SQL will qualify it incorrectly. Unfortunately, joining tables creates problems when multiple tables have columns with the same name, which happens a lot. Since SQL returns rows as hashes, later columns end up clobbering earlier columns, and this is one of the reasons that the has and belongs to many associations don't work on model join tables in active record. Now, you can only select certain columns or alias the columns manually, but that's a pain. Wouldn't it be great for something else to do the work and give you something usable back? And that's what graphing does. Graphing aliases everything for you and returns rows as a hash of hashes. The main hash is table symbol keys, and the subhashes have column keys and column values. This is a lot easier than aliasing everything yourself. I think graphing is one of SQL's unique features, and it makes dealing with joint table joins at a row base level much easier. While graphing is great, there are cases where joining and aliasing manually is better, mainly the main reason would be performance. On to SQL models. Remember that model classes are backed by dataset instances, and model instances represent single rows in the dataset. SQL doesn't require that you use a plain table for a model. You can use a join dataset if you want. Generally, a plain table is best if you want to create, update, or delete rows. You can use an ordered dataset to return all rows in a certain order by default, or a filter dataset to restrict the model to a subset of rows. Now, SQL didn't have associations when I started using it. People generally just wrote their own instance methods. It's easy to do that in SQL, but if you want caching, callbacks, reflection, eager loading, and methods to add or remove associated objects, it's a lot more work. Associations handle all that for you. They are created with method names that reflect the database relationship rather than imply ownership. Now, SQL does not use proxies for associations. The many-to-one -one association returns either the associated object or nil, and the too-many association method always returns an array. Most uses of a proxy can be handled using the association dataset method, which returns a dataset that you can filter, reorder, or otherwise modify. The many-to-one association adds a setter method, and the too-many associations add add association, remove association, and remove all association methods. I chose not to use proxies because I think they're more difficult to understand, implement, and reason about. With the association dataset method, there really isn't a need for them, and the add, remove, and remove all instance methods are simple and descriptive. Note that add and remove methods affect only the association. The remove method does not delete the past object from the database. Now, some people complain that association dataset is an ugly method name. Maybe so. However, accessing the dataset should be less frequent than accessing the associated objects. If you find yourself using the dataset a lot with different filters and stuff, you should add multiple associations with those filters built in. Doing so leads to more descriptive code. I added the clone option to make this easier. Now, clone is only one of about 30 current association options. Most users will only use a small number of them, but they exist to give users near complete control over all aspects of the association. All association defining methods also take a block that yields the data set that you can modify if there isn't an option available, which you could use, for example, to make an association a union of multiple data sets. 
Now, many of these options affect eager loading, which I'll discuss pretty soon. SQL provides the same association callbacks as AR and also adds an after load callback, which I use in an accounting app to figure out if the associated entry is a debit or credit to the current account. You can also use the extend option to extend the association data set with a module. Now, since SQL is a toolkit, flexibility is important, so the added methods are easy to override. You just override them and call super, no aliasing required. The modification methods are split into public and private parts. The private method starts with an underscore and does the query. The public method handles caching and callbacks. If you want the setter method to accept a hash in addition to a model object, you override the public method and call super. If you want to set an additional column in the database, you override the private method. SQL, SQL's eager loading gives you a choice whether to load associations in a separate query with eager or to use a join with eager graph. Using eager is recommended. If your association uses a different database, you must use eager. And if your order or filters use columns in an associated table, you must use eager graph. Both have the same API and can be used simultaneously. I chose to use two methods because they do very different things and to leave the choice th to the user. Also, SQL never attempts to parse SQL, so it wouldn't be able to guess which method was appropriate. SQL only supports three association types natively, but you can support any other association type using the dataset option, which takes a proc that is instance about. The has many through has many association just uses a filtered eager graph dataset. The has many through belongs to association isn't shown here because it's handled by the built-in many to many association. You can also create much more complex associations such as joining on any of multiple keys through a third table. Now that's not a hypothetical example made purposely difficult. I use this in one of my apps. Now, AR can actually handle that association using custom SQL. However, it can't eager load it. SQL supports eager loading of custom associations using the eager loader option. This option takes a proc that accepts a key to hash, an array of current objects, and the dependent associations to eagerly load. The key hash is an optimization. It's a hash of hashes with the keys being columns. The subhashes have column value keys with the values being an array of related objects. Let me break down how this example works. First, you get the subhash for the primary key, and you set the cache invoices for all the firms to the empty array. You then get all invoices for all clients of all the firms being eagerly loaded using the keys in the subhash. For each invoice, you get the value in the subhash for the invoices, clients, firm ID, foreign key, and you add that invoice to the firm. Now, this feature is powerful enough to load any association that can be eagerly loaded, and an eager wrapper option is also available to allow you to set custom joins when eager loading. Now, SQL does not support polymorphic associations because I think they are a bad idea. Their only purpose is to reduce the number of tables, which is a solution to a non-problem. An association between two separate classes should have its own join table for the same reason that you use separate tables for classes even if they have the same schema. Polymorphic associations are more complex and they break referential integrity. If you must use them, there is a SQL plugin that handles them. Now, that plugin doesn't do any monkey patching or craziness, it just uses the options and techniques I've already discussed. SQL's eager loader is even powerful enough to load all ancestors and descendants in a tree structure with a single call to eager. It's my belief that SQL has the most powerful and flexible associations of any Ruby or RM. Now, SQL supports validation similar to AR. My philosophy is that they should only be used for nice error messages, not data integrity. You should use database constraints if you want data integrity. It supports built-in validations, sort of similar to ARs here. Um, not the difference between uniqueness of with the array thing instead of using scope. And it also supports ones that you write yourself. Um, and these ones can also take similar options to the generic ones, such as if. Um, that's about all I want to discuss about that. SQL supports most of the same hooks as AR, and the usage is currently similar. Again, I prefer database triggers to hooks if you're doing something that involves data integrity. However, if you're targeting multiple databases, using hooks and validations is probably easier. SQL has built-in pagination support. It's really just a wrapper around limit that adds a few methods. It's helpful if you're writing a search engine. Each page uh, yields a paginated data set, or paginated version of the current data set a page at a time. If you use an adapter that buffers all records in memory before yielding, it can be useful to process a record set that won't fit in memory. SQL's built-in caching supports caching to any model object with um, an API uh, that's the same as Ruby Memcache. Now you can use SQL to add and create tables, or create and alter tables. Create table takes table name and a block, similar to active record. You have to explicitly use primary key if you want one. You can use the column method or method missing to create columns. You can use the index method to create indexes. If you use a Ruby class as a type, SQL uses the most appropriate database type for that class. If you use a symbol, SQL just uses it directly. SQL encourages the use of database constraints and allows you to create them using the check or constraint methods. SQL encourages real foreign key references, so foreign key takes a table argument. 
You can also use composite keys if you want. Alter tables are similar. You can add or drop columns, constraints, and indexes. Adding in foreign primary keys is easy. You can also use comp composite keys here. You can also change column's name, type, or default. Most, most table altering methods are called directly on the database object, um, or can be called directly on the database object. You can also rename and drop tables that, and create and drop views using the database methods. Now, generally, schema methods are called inside migrations. Migration proxies most methods, the database that applies it. Mm, main difference between active record mi migrations is the use of instance methods instead of um, class methods. Now, there is an individual migra migration API, but it's recommended to use SQL's migrator, which deals with the directory of individual migration files, sort of like Rails does. SQL's command line tool uses, uses the migrator with the dash M switch, but you can also use the migrator API. And my migration philosophy is that you should only do schema changes in a migration. You shouldn't do data modification unless it's necessary. And most importantly, keep your migrations decoupled from your models and your environment. Otherwise, it's likely that you'll make changes, that you'll break your old migrations, and you won't find out about it till later, and by then it might be too late. The migration files must use inter integer version numbers. I think timestamp migrations cause more problems than they solve. SQL currently supports a DM-like way of specifying schemas in your models. I think this is a bad idea as it makes migrations difficult. It also goes against my philosophy. I think a model is just a nice front end to the database, not that the database is just a place to store your model's data. You can use SQL just for persistence, but that's not really a design goal. Most databases I use were designed before I started using Ruby. And in my experience, most databases are app integration databases, not application databases. And I'll just say, if, you, if your data is what's important, design your app around your database, not vice versa. Let's move on to some advanced core features. SQL supports bound variables and prepared statements, and it does so in a database-independent manner. Database support for placeholders varies greatly, but with SQL, the API for all databases is the same. SQL ports the same interface, even though the database or adapter doesn't have native support. To use a bound variable, you specify the placeholder as a symbol starting with a dollar sign. When you call the statement, you provide a hash of symbols for the placeholders without the dollar signs. You have to tell SQL which type of statement you want to use, and for update insert statements, you can also provide a hash of attribute values, which can also include placeholders. Now, if there is native bound, vari bound variable support, this may be faster, but you should profile and or benchmark. The performance difference probably won't be significant unless the bound variables are expensive to literalize. Prepared statement support is similar. Instead of call, you use the prepare method on the data set and you give the statement a name. You can then call that statement through the returned object or through the database with the name. Now, prepared statements are most beneficial when the database spends a lot of time planning the same query. Generally, this is for very, very complex queries that you, in, that you use very often is when it has the most performance impact. If you prefer, prepare it once, the database only plans it once, it also has the same literalization benefits as bound variables. Now, you can use both of these on model data sets and get back model objects. The code for this is probably the most complex code in SQL, and I don't recommend using it without profiling and benchmarking. If you use it incorrectly, it can make your app slower. Now, SQL also supports database stored procedures in the MySQL and JDBC adapters, similar to the prepared statement support. The API is a little strange, as you call the database stored procedure on a data set object and specify a query type, but it's done this way so you can have a stored procedure that returns model objects, as well as one that doesn't return rows. SQL has built-in support for master-slave database configurations. Moving from a single database to a master-slave configuration can be done just by adding the servers option to the connect method with a read-only key. The read-only value should be a hash or a proc that returns a hash. It gets merged with the other options when a connection is requested. SQL will then use the slave database for selects and the master database for all their queries. You can also use multiple masters or slaves. This doesn't require any other code changes. Now, the master slave support is really just a subset of the generic sharding support. SQL makes it very easy to deal with a partition database. You can choose which server to use for any query with the server method. The connection pool handles the sharding, so it's supported with all adapters. Now, when using sharding, the tables you're using should have the same schema on each server. Otherwise, you should be using separate database objects. Now, I said earlier that SQL does not override method, methods added by Ruby, but it does add methods to the core classes. Now, most of these implement SQL's DSL, though certainly, currently some exist just to ease implementation. I'm going to review the ones related to the DSL. Now, hashes and arrays of all two pairs are used to specify conditions. By default, the condition entries are anded together. However, you can use SQL or to or the entries, you can use SQL negate and the negation of the entries, and you can use the bitwise negation operator to invert the conditions. The case method returns an SQL case statement, which is useful for things like conditional sums and a lot of other things. Now, since SQL usually treats arrays of all two pairs as conditions, you have to call the SQL array method if you want to treat it as an array. 
The hash written symbol bitwise and or methods are treated like logical and or. The as method is used to set up aliases. There's a few methods related to casting values. The cast methods can take Ruby classes, similar to how database types are handled in the schema methods. The cast numeric method also tells SQL it's a number, so it knows to treat the bitwise operators as bitwise operators in SQL. The cast string method tells SQL that it's a string, so, it, so if you do addition on it, it will do concatenation, similar to the way Ruby works. Now, since Ruby strings are usually treated as SQL strings by SQL, if you want the string to be used literally without quoting, you would call the lit method. You can also use placeholders in the string and call it with arguments. Sybil has the usual numeric dis expressions defined and they operate as expected in SQL. There's also an SQL function method that creates SQL functions. Now, if you're using one, Ruby 1.8, you can use the array access operator to create SQL, SQL functions, and you can also use the inequality operators directly on SQL, uh, on Symbol. The reason that doesn't work in Ruby 1.9 is that Ruby defines those operators for you, those methods for you, and um, SQL does not override methods defined by Ruby. Now, you can use the identifier method to handle a symbol as a single identifier, so it's not going to care about the double or triple underscores. You can use the qualify method to qualify a table or a column with a table. The like and I like methods handle searching, and you can use regular expressions on PostgreSQL or MySQL. The SQL number and SQL string methods work similar to cast numeric and cast string, but without the casting. Now, SQL knows a little bit, again, how database types work. So if knows an object is a string in SQL, you won't be able to use the division operator, and the addition operator will do concatenation. Now, most methods added to symbol and the like also work on the objects that SQL creates, which is what allows you to build complex queries directly in Ruby. Now, SQL comes with a command line tool called SQL. You can uh, call it either with a connection string or a path to YAML file as an argument. It gives you an IRB shell with a database object in DB already defined. You can also use it to run migrations, like I said, with the dash M switch. It's great for quick access and playing with SQL. With the dash L option, you can load all files in your model, direct, in your model directory. It starts quickly, so you can too. Now, SQL isn't really designed around the needs of web applications, but it does work well with them. Um, SQL settings by default are, are very strict. I'm a big um, proponent of security. So most people want to turn off some of them. Um, for example, raise on typecast failure. Otherwise, user input errors will raise exceptions before the validations are called. Now, you can turn off typecasting completely, but it's not as good a solution. Um, there's a validation called the validates not string. You can use that to check that non-string columns don't have string values. If you have a string value and a non-string column, and you have typecasting enabled, and raise on typecast failure is false, then it's obvious that typecasting failed, so it will add a validation error. Now, turning off raise on save failure is necessary if you don't want to use begin and rescue to catch save failures. You can turn off strict param setting to uh, cause SQL not to you know, raise an exception if there is an attempt to access a restricted setter method in a mass assignment call. Um, that makes debugging more difficult, so I urge caution before doing that. Um, all these methods can be set on a per model or per instance level. SQL offers multiple mass assignment methods. Set only is uh, the recommended one as it only allows access to the attributes you specify. This is a better approach than setting allowed, the allowed columns at a model level as you can decide which attributes are allowed in each call. Now, some forms may let you set some attributes and not others, and you should make sure that no form submission can update more attributes than really are on the form. Now, for consistency, there's also a set restricted method. It works as you might expect, but I don't really recommend it. You can also use SQL just like AR and set allowed or restricted columns at the model level and just use set to update the attributes. For very simple applications, um, that may be the easiest way to go. Now, SQL is lightweight compared to AR and DM. Um, SQL core is 63% smaller than DM core, and all of SQL is still 33% smaller. All of SQL is 3.5 times smaller than DM more and 2.5 times smaller than active record. SQL loads as fast as DM core and, is, and loads 2.5 times faster than AR or DM more. SQL is comparable to active record and performance from the benchmarks I've seen, um, and that's, I mean, performance optimization hasn't even been a focus during my maintenance. I've mainly worked on new features, bug fixes, and cleaning the internals. SQL is currently at 2.11, and only a year ago it was at 1.3. There was a release every two or three weeks for a while, but now I, I stick to a very strict monthly release cycle. I take bug reports very seriously. Bugs posted on the bug tracker get fixed within a day to a week. I actually try to fix bugs that don't affect me personally. You don't even have to provide specs if the bug's obvious, and SQL's blood tracker is usually empty. Now, I run the full release test suite before pushing to GitHub, so the master branch is as stable as you know, the, the main releases, um, at least if you use one of the databases I test. Um, I run all my personal apps directly off the master branch. Um, I write 
pretty descriptive commit messages, so uh, if you're pulling, be sure to read them to see, because sometimes I do change features, and if you rely on those features, you need to change your app. Um, it's very easy to contribute to SQL. There's no bureaucracy, there's no plus ones. You just show me the code, tell me why it's a good idea. I accept patches via IRC, the Google group, the bug tracker, or GitHub. I don't accept all patches, and I modify many I do accept, but you will get a response quickly. I prefer specs with new features, but I'll write, my, I'll write the specs myself if I think a feature is a good idea. I'll even rewrite the implementation if I like the feature, but not the patch. Now, the future is coming, and it is SQL 3. As much as possible, it's going to be compatible with SQL 2. I like the move from 1.5 to 2.0. I'll be deprecating stuff in 2.12 and removing it in 3.0. Many built-in features will be moving into plugins or extensions that still ship with SQL, but will not need to be required separately. The majority of this work is already completed and available in the master branch. It's going to be more lightweight, easier to use, and cleaner internally than SQL 2. Now, to touch on something Yehuda mentioned, um, uh, models are, are moving to a complete plugin structure. Even the basic model, model functionality is a plugin. Model associations are a plugin. You can have plugins that work on a level for all models. You can override any method you want. You can just call super. The only method in SQL model that is not pl in, a, in a plugin itself is the plugin method, which handles plugins. And uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll open it up to the floor for questions now. Are there databases? Can you migrate, do migrations on those two? Um, you, I, it's not really set up to do that. You probably have to do that, do that manually. Oh, um, the, read the question. Do you just, with sharded databases, does SQL handle running the migrations? And no, the answer is not currently. Um, if you wanted to work on a patch, it's probably not something that would be too difficult. Um, but no, it doesn't do that now. Uh, there's a question I can barely see your hand because of the light, but. What's the deal with pass one and how the SQL doesn't have it? What pass one? What's the deal with pass one and why SQL doesn't have that association here? Oh, has one. Um, has one sort of an odd association. You, there is something uh, you can use a one-to-one -one option on a one-to-many association. It gives you like the has one type setter, um, but it, it doesn't have one simply because it's a rare need, and the one-to-one -one option really does handle the, the most you know usual use, which is just you want a setter for the method. It's just that's how, how it is. <laughs> Last chance. Okay. Thank you very much for your time.